When you're ready. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Cashmere Goat Association's Ask Me Anything on Cashmere Goat Animal uh, Startup and Care. My name is Danielle Fowler, and I'm joined today by our three panelists, uh, Dorothy McClure, Wendy Pei, and uh, Tatiana Stanton. So a little bit about our panelists for today. Uh, Dorothy has a farm in Kansas and has been working with cashmere goats since 2016. She works with Clean Cashmere and has a lot of interest with cashmere goats, ranging from cashmere production to meat production. Wendy, and we may also be joined later by her husband, Peter, runs Springtime Farm. Um, they've been raising cashmere goats since 1997. They work to improve their fiber quality and have been acted in what has become the Cashmere Goat Association. They're both approved judges for CGA and have hosted a workshop for active and aspirant judges on their farm in 2023. And last but not least, uh, Tatiana. Goats have been a major part of Tatiana's uh, home life and career for over 50 years. She started out as a backyard dairy goat raiser and became the herds person for several commercial or research goat dairies and also did developmental work with goat farmers in the Caribbean and Latin America. Although she has just retired as the Cornell University goat and sheep extension specialist, she still maintains her pasture-based meat goat herd. Um, now we have several questions that we've collected from the um, social media that we are gonna get started with, but I invite everybody to go into the chat and um, also include your questions. So the first question we have from social media that I'll bring to our panelists, I would like to know more details about breeding a better cashmere goat, more specifically for the San Clemente Island goat breed. Some goats have potential and we don't wanna crossbreed. What would a timeline look like to breed for SCI goats or any goat to produce better cashmere animals? Who wants to go first? <laughs> oh, so, oh, I thought one person was going to be asked to go ahead. But go ahead. Oh, well, anyone that would like to take that question. I think hopefully someone else will add more, but I think one thing would just be, you know, what the potential of the breed already is there. And so it, it may take a while, depending on that, on the breed potential. Um, you know, you may be talking at least five generations if it, if it you know, if you're not doing any out, out breeding at all. And, and it may take longer if there's just not much there. And just keeping in mind that, you know, there's a negative physical correlation between, uh, um, uh, between the thickness of your fiber and the length and weight of your fiber. And, you know, with cashmere, we're looking for something that's gonna be fairly fine, or quite fine, but also fairly productive. Um, and so that can be challenging. It, you know, it's more challenging than if you're crossbreeding in an Angora, you know, to try and get a bunch of fiber of, of, of really no sense sort. So it, it, I would imagine it's going to take a while. Those of you who have worked with dairy goats and bringing them to become cashmere goats probably have a better idea of how many generations it's going to take if you're not doing any outbreeding. I think um, we got our first goats from a woman named Yvonne Taylor. And what she had participated when they first were bringing in cashmere goats and she purchased a buck. Uh, an Australian buck and crossed him. And a lot of her goats were, I think, probably dairy. And so when we bought those youngsters, they most of them had cashmere, although some of them were much finer. So we started looking for another buck, which we found and which really changed the whole dynamic of our herd in terms of fiber quality. So you got to get your fiber judged every year. You know, there's the lab to send it to. Uh, and there's individuals who will do judging cashmere and just keep working at it. And the ironic thing for us was I had a doe who, uh, she was 20 microns, and I got a buck from Linda and Paul Fox out in Oregon, who was at 17 microns. I bred those two, and since then, nobody in that bloodline has gone over 15 microns. So it's worth exploring, you know, getting a buck here or a buck there. 
But if you can get a buck who is already completely cashmere, I think it's really helpful. I don't know how that but, works. But Wendy, what she's saying is she is not going to be breeding outside of the San Clemente breed. She's she's staying within the San Clemente breed and trying to produce a produce cash, you know, high yielding cashmere goats without going doing any outcrossing to another breed. Yeah, and that's maybe she just keeps looking for those in her herd that have some cashmere and then kind of so i think a real big first step is is measuring you know measuring what's there so you can start seeing which 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 bucks and which does are producing the most right and and then and 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 hopefully you're in contact with other san clemente breeders so that you're able to you know not keep your genetics from getting too inbred Great answers. All right. So for the next question, um, I'd like to get some opinions and wisdoms on allowing does to kid in the field versus keeping them in a stall. Who'd like to take this one? I let mine breed in the, or deliver in the fields. I don't have really a, I have a barn, but it's not very conducive for putting all of my goats in a stall. So I, I let them breed outside. I do have shelters that they can go into and um, I've used dog houses that are fairly big that they can get into. And it's mainly for the babies to get into, but the moms squish themselves in there. And I've not had any kids get smashed or, or die from that. Um, and I also have uh, water tanks that I turn bigger water tanks. I turn on the side and they'll get in there for shelter. But I, all of mine, I don't ever put any of mine in the barn. It's just, I don't have the facility, I guess, to do that. I have lots of um, acreage for them to graze and to be on, but I just don't have a facility to do the stall. But I, I am also in, in Kansas, so, and I try to time my kidding for like March, April. So a little bit, I don't know if that's later or not, but I've done it in February and it's just too cold here. So I just try to kind of time my, my kidding times. Yeah, I, I know we did a low input lambing and kidding study where we looked at pasture kidding. And I think a lot of it is the time of year you're doing it. And then here in New York, you know, we can have really bad hailstorms or we can have rain turn to snow. And so having a book, good backup plan, if you are going to have to bring those animals in and you'll probably want to bring the herd in rather than bringing, or at least bring in that doe with a friend of hers. So she's not coming in alone if you're having to, you know, bring her in in the middle of her going into her delivery. Um, cause, cause that can really mess up her hormones if you're trying to move her right, right in that. But at the same time, you do need to do that. But normally with past your kidding, as long as you're, you know, keep an eye on them. It's great because they can separate themselves from the herd. Their hormones work well. You know, if there is a problem, you want them ideally to not be so wild that they're difficult to catch without them getting super, super nervous. I've had some sheep farms where that's been an issue. Someone's obviously had a dis dissocia and they're a really nervous group of animals that are hard to handle. And the animal, the mother animal, has gotten really worked up in, while people have been trying to catch her to assist her. Um, and then the other thing I've seen with pasture kidding, if you're going to be cast, you know, banding at birth, you know, um, if you're planning to band the kids um, or do any disputing or something fairly early on, you want to do it early enough that they're easy for you to catch. You know, instead of you racing across you know a large acreage trying to catch them. So I noticed that people who do pasture kidding and pasture lambing tend to do those things, you know, the ear tagging and all that a little earlier than we might do for an animal who has her kids in a stall. But yeah, it's great and you get usually less ketosis because they're being active, you know, out there moving around a lot and stuff. So yeah. Great. The time of year, making sure it's a time of year that's suitable for kidding outside or that you've got good shelters that they can go into and, you know, if, if, if there is a problem with the weather. Perfect. Thank you. The next question we have, um, 
For someone completely starting out, kids all look so cute. How do you pick your starter herd? I think the most important thing is finding a good breeder, somebody who who does cashmere. I'm I feel really lucky. I get all of my herd has been from Heidi Dickens. Oh man. Yeah. So I feel like and she's she's probably a little less than two hours for me. So I can get to her pretty easily. But I think just finding somebody who's who's a good breeder and somebody that I mean, I feel like I if I needed something from Heidi, I could just call her and she'd answer any question I have. think uh tell me the question again uh, for somebody starting out um what are some tips for choosing a starter herd i think if you can i know this won't work for the san clementes uh, but if you can find people who get their fiber tested and you might got to remember it's 50 degrees 50 percent um fiber and 50 percent body because the other part is meat animal and so looking for that balance and looking at your own herd and where their strengths and weaknesses are, and you can learn that, for, you can learn confirmation pretty easily from looking at the animals and comparing them to other meat animals uh, with a fiber. You know, there are, there are judges who'll do it and there are labs who will also uh, examine your fiber and you just keep keeping the animals that are presenting good fiber and that don't get coarser as they age. And so it's just a case of keeping an eye on it. Yeah, I, I think asking, you know, the farm if they have fiber measurements and stuff um, and and looking at the close relatives of the doe kids that you're trying to purchase or the buck you're trying to purchase. Um, and I think asking really direct questions about disease instead of saying, is your herd healthy? Say, you know, have you ever had CL abscesses? If so, how long ago was it? Have you ever had sore mouth? So be be aware of the different contagious diseases and ask, you know, with very politely ask specific questions about about those. Yeah. Uh, next question is about fencing. So um, as cashmere are typically horned, um, what fencing types are recommended? I, my husband and I have been working on since we've had goats, putting in good goat fence and you can get, I mean, lots of different, there's lots of different brands I feel like out there. Um, Red brand is, is good. Uh, we use stay tough just cause it's pretty flexible. Um, just anything that they cannot stick their heads through cause they will do it. And if, even if it's, they could go around it, they'll still stick their heads through it. So I, I, th I feel like our biz biggest obstacle has been the fencing and we've just been putting up good fence. Uh, so they, Dorothy, what kind of spacing do you have in your squares? They they kind of range from like the top being a little bit bigger and then they kind of go lower as it goes as it goes down to the ground. Um, but like on a rare occasions, my kid, the kids will get their head stuck in it, but not normally. They're smaller than hog panels. Um, I think maybe. I think if you if you're using hog panels in your holding pen, which we use hog panels in our holding pen, and we feed outside the fence, you know, we feed from round bales outside the fence, which means that we end up with some does getting stuck, you know, because we some of our does, even though we have boar goats, are, were originally alpine crosses, and that's a real pain. So I think. You know, even in your holding pen, going with with a you know square size where it isn't going to be easy for goats to put their th heads heads through and get get their horns stuck. I mean, it's fine if they get their heads through as long as they can get their head back out. But a lot, you know, um, some of them, you know, their horns flare enough that they can't get them back out, and that's going to be a real nuisance. We also use a lot of electronet at our farm. And you know, you'll have people say, oh, you can't use Electronet on horned goats. And you know, we wouldn't be able to have our pasture-based operation if we didn't use Electronet. But you know, you have to train them extremely well, just like any other goat to, to Electronet. So they'll stay in. But um, I do know like 
Wendy, like, do you use the narrower squares? It's just so expensive, the red brand. That's more the, you know, four by four square instead of the larger squares, but. Um, I, th I think page wire as metal mm -hmm. uh, could yeah. work quite well because they, the size of the opening is such that kids can't get through and get stuck. So you're not looking. We have, oh, probably our smallest area, grazing area is probably 35 acres. And so what we've done is use high tensile fencing and it's strands of wire on a coil and you put it out and the lower ones are closer together and we put seven different lines out and it goes from tree to tree around say a 40 acre space and it's keeps out coyotes really well and it keeps in uh, the goats really well and once they get used to oh that's electric you probably could turn it off but we don't do that and it doesn't it's not expensive to do it but you have to maintain it tree comes down on it you know you got to go get and fix it that kind of thing but once it's up and we've learned over the years how to make it better and better like we go from tree to tree because we have a lot of forest and we'll put up a pressure treated two by four and then we'll put the places where the fence goes through on that and that way as the tree grows and things you know it's a different kind of concept of protecting the tree by not putting too much into it so I think that's the main thing we've done, but I think page wire is really successful as well. It's not electric. Right. So the high tensile is going to be cheaper, you know, doing the strands of the electrified high tensile. But I think, like you say, I've seen people try and go like with four strands or five strands, and we use six strands. And even that, you know, thinking about it nowadays, I would have liked if we had gone seven strands. And I think it re is really important to keep it on. We made the mistake. Some of ours was getting pretty encroached on by brush and stuff. And so we let our goats, you know, gr we turned the fence off and let them start grazing through it. And since then, we've had a horrible time with go goats not respecting our high tensile. And all our perimeter fencing is six strands of high tensile. And now we're having to reinforce it with our electronet. We've always used the electronet for subdividing, but now it's going to take a real training because we, you know, we, we blew it. And, and I thought, oh, if we just blow it, you know, if we just let them graze it a couple of times, it won't be a problem. But they, um, it, it, it was, it was surprising how quickly it's become, became a problem. So I've been, I've been using the electronet to, to in addition to our, the fin, the permanent fence that we put up. And I, I really like it. I think the key to that is checking it and making sure yeah. that it's hot. Yeah. yeah, and especially a horn goat can, you know, ch choke themselves in the electronet if, if it's not on. So you really want it always hot, you know, um, and, and you want them to really learn from a very young age to respect it. Um, okay. If somebody gets their head caught, the yelling is terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> and to turn the fence off and untangle them. You know, in smaller areas, that's the kind of thing we do as well. And it, you know, it, it's, I don't know, the high tensile to me is, it, once it's up, it's minimum taken care of. We're trying to keep the deer out because of the meningeal worm. And you have to go to t eight or 10 feet. Yeah. It's, you know, that's not really, I haven't seen any deer in it for a while. And the coyotes, once they hit it, they're not going to go back and check that out. So for, for us being in a fairly rural area, that really helps. Great, thanks. Next question is um, balancing biosecurity with public tours, outreach, or events for those that want to do that at their farm. What is everybody's thoughts there? I think, you... go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna rephrase it. Oh, okay. But go ahead. I, I think one big question is, who's coming onto the farm? Is it more, more kindergarten groups or is it more um, people who are likely to be raising some sort of livestock? Um, and so, you know, if, if it's, you know, I think more and more you have to assume that they may be around some other livestock or something. And, and so um, 
you know, that balance of if you have a nice, easy way for them to disinfect their feet, you know, that, that sort of sort of the minimum of what you want to be doing there. Um, or is it really, I mean, usually we're wanting them to be able to play with the animals and touch the animals. So, um, you know, it, it's one thing of, of before they come, letting them know that if they do have uh, livestock at home, don't wear clothes that they've been wearing around the livestock and don't wear shoes they've been wearing around the livestock, if possible. For yeah. quite a few years, we um, we would do a Mother's Day because all the baby goats were running around and the mothers and people would come and it was wonderful, but there was invariably one or two families that wouldn't control their kids. They'd go in the pasture and start chasing the goats. And so we finally stopped doing it. And we ran goat husbandry classes here over weekends for several years. And that was really successful for people to come onto a farm and see different kinds of fencing and different ways of handling the animals. And I would encourage people all around the country to invite people to your farm and show them what you do because there are a lot of people interested in these goats. I, so it's I haven't worried. I probably should worry more about the biosecurity. Most most visitors I have are my friends from work or acquaintances from work, and they're not ever around other animals. So. Yeah, I think if you are doing agritourism, you, you need to be thinking about a good way to disinfect people's feet pri primarily. And that usually doesn't mean putting bleach in, in, in something, you know, because you've got people with really nice sneakers and everything. So finding a disinfectant that's going to be really effective, but is not going to be a problem uh, for people to step in. If they're not going to be actually handling the animals and your animals are really calm about booties and they're not going to be really young children who are going to slip easily in booties, then certainly putting on the plastic booties can work. Um, that those are really, you know, if, if it's icy conditions, those those can be treacherous. So you need to think of something that's pretty easy for people to disinfect their feet with. But I think it's, it's primarily the feet we're worth worrying about. And then, you know, just because you are, you're worried about biosecurity for them and you need to remember that a lot of people haven't been around manure and stuff. So having an easy way for them to wash their hands before they leave the farm or before they eat anything is, is important. And don't let people give their pacifiers to your, to your goats. Oh, um, <laughs> right. no, I, we, I've seen that one and, uh, and then had them instantly stick it back in their baby's mouth. And it's been like, no. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Oh, boy. So next topic is one of my least favorites, but many of us in New England are currently dealing with this, is mud. Uh, what are your thoughts for managing your goat's hooves in the mud? <laughs> oh, my. We, I know that we have sleeping benches in our barn, so and it's more something that I learned to do more in the tropics. Um, so when the goats come into the barn, you know, we, we have a slatted, you know, they, they can come up, step onto these benches that are probably about I need a two, two or three feet. And then they run the length of the barn walls. And so they can jump on those. Um, and so that helps us a lot because we don't trim hooves very much, um, and our hooves do get pretty long and, and the animals are in a lot of mud, you know, when, when it's not the pasture season. Um, so, so those have helped us having a way for them to get up out of the mud. It does make cleaning the barn a pain in the, a real pain. And I wish we had made them removable, you know, when, when we did them. I mean, I don't, we don't have huge mud problems, but usually in the spring, it can, in certain areas of our, of our property could get kind of muddy. I, I feel like the worst part for me, having my goats in the field most of the year or all of the year is between pastures, like where there's gates. So I'll put like a layer of gravel down. That seems like it's always a place where it gets really muddy. I'll put gravel down. And I mean, sometimes it's hard to keep up with their feet, but just trying to 
keep up with them. And some goats, the hooves grow faster than others. And if you can keep the ones that are growing faster, short, you know, trim them more often than maybe some of the others. That brings us really nicely to the next question. And I think Wendy and Peter, this one's going to be for you. Um, it's about trimming hooves. So what do you recommend for trimming hooves? And does anybody have an experience using the hoof boss that they care to share? Pros or cons? Well, we got, we'll get Peter. He just left the room for a minute. He'll be <laughs> back. And he's, he's the expert hoof trimmer and I rely on him all I can. We're lucky enough that we have a lot of rock. And so there's a lot of natural hoof trimming there, but you really have to keep an eye on it. And there's a question is for you and Dottie Peter. Oh, what's it? About hoof trimming. Yeah, so the question is, uh, what do you recommend for trimming hooves? And have you ever tried the hoof boss? And would you recommend it? What was the hoof boss? The electric, the drip. Oh, the I, grinder. I've got no problem with that. I can't see any reason to need it, though. Uh, a, a pair of clippers seems to do fine. Uh, in the, if we get any rock at all, if we can get them out on the rock, they trim themselves. The horses trim themselves. Um, the, during the winter or during mud, you, you pretty much have to do a six-week thing. Uh, and if you let it get ahead of you, you it's hard to catch up. Um, <clears throat> but I, 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 don't, I don't see any problem with the clippers. But um, I, I, I've never used the, the buzzsaw like that. I've seen it. Are there any clippers you specifically like, Peter? Well, I, I'm the, the one that buys them. They're they're from ARS. They're expensive, but they hold an edge. There are some other ones that are a lot less, and I don't remember who they are. But when Peter was at doing hoof trimming at uh, oh a few years ago at the pri in New York, and that was. He, then he used those ones, but they only hold an edge for one or two trims. And so you kind of like, that can get really frustrating. But the ARS, I haven't bought them in a long time now, but they uh, they go, they go were going around $42 a pair. But if they work for a bunch of goats, and we've, we've scaled down quite a bit now over the la last few years, nonetheless, hoof trimming hangs out there. And the goat will come up to me and put up her foot like, look. <laughs> Could you look at this foot, please? I need a trim. <laughs> Tatiana, have you ever tried the hoof boss? I've I've known people who have used used hoof bosses, um, and I've had some people really really love them. I think it's important to the the grinder element on it, you know, to to get the right one for for the for the situation. So no, I haven't ever had a chance to use them myself. They're, um, you know, I've been there while people are using them and and it, they, it seemed to me, I was worried that they'd be loud enough that the animals would have trouble with them and that they seem to get used to the noise pretty quickly. You know, so, so no, has anyone else had experience with them? No, but I'm about to, that's encouraging, it's interesting. I've actually had the same question myself because my um, I've had surgery on my hands, so I can only do so many trims in a row before it starts to hurt. Uh, that might be a good question for the sheep goat, um, the Cornell sheep goat management listserv. There's got to be someone on there that has a hoof boss. All right. So we'll come back to you on the hoof boss question. Well, one, Stay one tuned. Is you can buy, you can buy a, a a small planer that you get at a at a place a you know a lumber store mm -hmm. and you can there's a little red one that's small and if you keep up with it like do them every whatever you'll figure out from the contours of your pastures how often to do it it's a quick swipe and there's no electric involved so it's worth thinking about yeah Another i've always time. had trouble with a planer i don't know if i just don't use them right or what but i've I've always found that they require more strength than I have to really, you know, get, get anywhere yeah. with them. Mostly I corner my husband. <laughs> <laughs> Next question we have is about AI. So this person 
uh, would prefer not to keep a buck as they have a very small herd. Does anyone artificially inseminate on the small scale? Um, they're in a location where they don't have others raising cashmere nearby. Don't they do that in Oklahoma? Um, I, I know Heidi does, does it. I, I think one big problem is you're gonna need a tank to store the semen in. So I know like Blue Mountain, um, genetic, you know, goat genetics uh, carries cashmere goat semen uh, that I think has micron measurements on it. And, you know, they do have fleece me measurements on it. Uh, but the problem is you're gonna either need a tank or you're gonna need to be able to borrow a tank uh, and to store the semen in. Um, until you use it or when you use it. So it, it gets expensive that way. And then, you know, without training and stuff, and even with training, your conception rates are a lot less than than with a buck. Um, so, I mean, you, you definitely would want to take an AI course or like we have videos online um, that we have a website, the Cornell's um, Small Ruminant Dairying website. And, and we have like a set of, many hours of video on there on how, how to AI that people can look at, but you know, you, you aren't gonna have it, it, you know, you're gonna have to decide if it's financially worth it. And if you only have a couple of animals, unless you've got a cow dairy near you or a AI um, technician who works with cows near you, who's willing to store the semen for you, you know, it, it can get expensive. And to get the semen shipped to you, unless you can meet one of these companies at a show or something, it, it's expensive to get a shipper, you know, get, a, get an AI, a semen shipper to send to them and send back to you. So it's, it, it can be an expensive proposition, you know, a lot more than just the cost of the straws themselves. So it's not that you can't do it, but, oh. you know, it'd be, it'd be you know, it, it's, it's expensive. So try to find a pal nearby in the dairy industry <laughs> with all that stuff. This is a funny story, but we used to raise um, perch on horses and found a really nice stallion oh, quite a far ways away. And I happened to, at the time, be a state representative. And so the woman would get the semen from the stallion on the day that Peter called and said that the mayors were circuit what an estrus whatever it is and so i would be sitting amongst this 155 people and somebody would come in and say representative hey you have something waiting for you <laughs> in the clerk's office and it would be semen that then peter would come up and get and put in the mayors and it was successful every time but it, there's a lot of humor you can find if you want to in a lot of these things <laughs> Next question I have uh, for a new, someone new to cashmere. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between cashmere and angora? Yeah. Angora is angora is a single follicle animal, and they grow a a nice fiber, and they get actually shorn twice a year to gather that fiber. Whereas goats have two follicles, they have a guard hair to protect the cashmere. And they shed the cashmere before the guard hair, if they shed it. I don't know if they even shed the guard hair, but they shed that in the spring and we generally comb it. You can also shear it. And I think clean cashmere has worked hard to be like what they do in Australia, which is not any more guard hair than they can possibly have. And so what they shear off is almost completely cashmere. And so it's a different, it's a different process. And and Angora, the qualities of Angora and the qualities of cashmere for textile work are, are very different from each other. You know, um, mohair looks a lot different than cashmere does. And, and the yield of Angora or of mohair is going to be much more than the year, yield of cashmere. Um, so it takes a lot, you know, fewer goats to make a mohair sweater than it does to make a cashmere sweater. So, um, Wendy or uh, Dor Dorothy, do you want to talk a little bit about the qual qualities of cashmere, of why it's such okay. a nice fiber and, and stuff like that, and how it's different from 
mohair, which is also nice. Yeah. <clears throat> well, cashmere comes from really from the Himalayas, from the highest mountains in the world and some of the most extreme temperatures in the world. And the so they those goats there developed an under undercoat, which is very fine and very crimpy, trapped the warmth in, and then they would comb them in the spring. And then that fiber is what became the cashmere. And it was so rare and exceptional that only royalty could get it. Oh, maybe a hundred years ago, because it was coming out of Mongolia, coming out of Nepal, coming out of India, Northern India. And that's where cashmere got started. And it was absolutely one of the most luxurious fibers in the world. Gradually, people have started raising cashmere goats that can have just as fine fiber with careful breeding and paying attention. And so that's now it's a whole different process. And some of us comb and some of us shear to get the cashmere, cashmere out. And I they didn't have electricity, but they had some big, big scissors for those folks in the Himalayas that got tired of trying to comb it out uh, before it matted. So I don't know if that responds. Mm -hmm. Uh, next question we have is, how much pasture do you recommend per goat? We're all quiet. I, I feel like, Tatiana, this might, it might be a good one for you. I mean, it depends so much on what your pasture yields and the season of the year. I mean, here in New York, we usually expect that we're going to need twice as much pasture in um later in the season in August, September, October, November, than we are going to need in May and June. Um, so, I, I mean, it, it's really hard to say, oh, five goats per acre and their kids, you know, um, because so much of it depends on, are you having to rotate really fast and not come back to a pasture, you know, for a long time, like not come back for 60 days because of worm, uh, parasitic worm concerns, you know, gastrointestinal worms. Um, you know, it it just really, it just really varies. Um, so I think having a cushion in there is really helpful because it can vary so much from year to year what what what's available to you. And having in in our area, it's it's warm in the summer, and it's moist in the summer, and worm it's really perfect worm conditions. And so it's really good in in my situation to be able to switch on to like hay fields or pastures that you've used for other animals or pastures that you've been mowing um, when you get into late July, you know, when the worms can get really bad. And so that causes you to need a little bit more, more land as well. Um, so. We, we've had some really dry summers. Last summer wasn't near as bad as the summer before. So I, I also feel like you kind of have to take this different years into consideration. Last, I feel like I started feeding hay, hay bales in September. And the year before that, I didn't start feeding until December. This last year, I started feeding at the very end of December because we had such a, like, we had nice rain. We had a great year last year, and we had grass until almost Christmas. So I feel like that, that kind of makes a difference, too. I, I always try to make sure I have backup, like, whether it's going to, if it's, if it's going to be just to try to, I guess, kind of prepare and make sure that I have enough food or hay for everybody whether it's going to be good or bad, sometimes you don't know, but just always have enough to get you by. That makes kind of over-prepare. That mm -hmm. makes really good sense. And that's kind of what we do as well. We're, again, we're a rocky area. And when we bought this land, there wasn't a pasture in sight. There was all trees, young trees, old trees, beautiful old growth pine. And so we start fencing it and goats are browsers they prefer browsing to grazing and so we had so many saplings coming up that i'd go out and cut a few and they'd come out and eat everything in 10 minutes and our local fire department brings us the balsam christmas trees every year that people turn in from our town and they go out and those goats are just like 
right on it. So the more we can have variety, you know, and it depends on if you have pasture and that's your option, you know, that that's a little more challenging than those of us that have a forest that they can go wander in as long as we keep the deer out because that, that causes that meningeal worm. I mean, I think, you know, one thing is to, uh, to sort of have an, an understanding of how much dry matter is out in your pastures, you know, so throwing a hoop that's, you know, maybe three yard area, three by three yard area in it, or, a, you know, foot by foot area in it, and drying that, you know, in your microwave or something with a little water, and getting an idea of, okay, supposedly this, you know, supposedly I have this much dry matter per acre. And if I think of a goat needing about three to 4% of its body weight in um, in dry matter each day, you know, and I, I want to leave them out here for, you know, for four days before I move them to the next area, you can try and get a ballpark figure that way. But so much of it is just looking and seeing, um, and and so it it just makes it hard to say you need this many acres per goat per year. It, it's as you visual as you visualize it and see it, you start knowing your pastures and, and start knowing in a dry year, I can get by this way in a wet year, you know, I, I can get by with less land. Oh. Wow, that's helpful. Yeah. Next question, um, will the cashmere quality change as the goat ages? Well, since I, for years and years and years, hoping to improve our fiber, found that the goats vary somewhat, but it seems to me a little bit like if, if I'm 14 microns or less in my first combing, it might work its way up but it seems to go within a bloodline that some never get over 14 microns and others go up. But I think when they get older, it comes down again. Just looking at my 12 and 13 year olds that were 13, 14 in their, in their youth and went up to 15 are now back at 13. So I don't know if other people have had that same experience, but that's what I've had. Any other thoughts there? I, I think it does depend on your bloodlines. I think that does make a difference. Like who's who's gonna keep keep their microns low and uh, cool. This next question, we can all smell this, right? Is cashmere from bucks okay or does the smell ruin it? <laughs> I don't think it does. I mean, if you harvest it in the fall, which which I don't ever, um, because they're going to need it for winter. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I took my cashmere off my buck this year. It, I didn't go on his round his like on his legs. It was still a little stained, but I I don't really feel like they smell that bad in the spring. It's mainly just the fall for me is when they do not smell good, and they don't pee all over. <laughs> like all over their backs or their back legs they kind of keep it down low they're very proud of that scent but once it goes to the mill uh, we go to still river mill in connecticut any any leftover whatever may be sent in there is long gone once it's washed that's a relief to us buck owners good to know so next question. Do you know um, any resources regarding the effect of different feed on fiber? We're looking to improve our feeding program. You have anything on that? I, I don't I don't know. I think I think the breeding program is more important than what they get to eat. But I imagine if a goat's skinny, it's gonna get finer fiber and more of it than a goat that's fat. But that's speculation. I I don't have a clue. Well, and I think one thing is more making sure that there's you know that the nutrition is good when the when the 
Joe is developing that fetus so that it develops enough, you know, plenty of follicles. Um, it is is more the thing, yeah, because I've seen the thing of, oh, my fiber is a little coarse, and the reason it's coarse is because I'm feeding them too good a diet, so I should I should stress them a little bit nutritionally, and I think it's you know that may be true environmentally, but it it like like Wendy says, it makes more sense to approach it from a genetic standpoint and try and you know breed genetics that that have that finer and yet are still somehow able to have a fairly good yield longer longer fiber. But but, but that the pregnant doe is is you know you you want to be. I I feed my does. A, a lot extra when they're when they're pregnant, you know, until I, I wean the babies because and they will well when they're in utero and like Tatiana said, it really helps put the put follicles on that baby, but also um I think nutritionally wise just to keep keep her at a healthier uh -huh. weight. They, they do have a thing that they call hunger fine. That is, if they don't get any food and they're trying to get through a winter, that their fiber will get finer. But I don't know if I believe it. I just know that it's it's circulated about, about I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe. Yeah, it's always been true about before. Yeah, so. I'm not, and I, I don't, I don't want to stress my, I don't like stressing my animals. I feel like it's too much stress for them. Oh no, they talk to me every day. How high am I supposed to jump? That's the, that's my mantra. Yes, dears. <laughs> yeah. Babies. Yeah. Next question we have is about um, selling cashmere. Um, where and how does one sell cashmere fiber? And is producing cashmere profitable when considering the cost of purchasing cashmere goats? You've worked with clean cashmere. Tell us about it. Yeah, I I love clean cashmere. <laughs> it's a great outlet for me to sell all my cashmere. Um, and they are really, they're producing really beautiful yarns and their roving is, I mean, when you talk, you know, between between Angora and goats and the cashmere goats, that roving is wonderful. Um, so I, I sell, I've been selling all of mine and last year I had met up with Heidi in the summer. So I, I brought all my cashmere with me and she shipped it. Um, I have sh otherwise shipped it myself and I can't remember what they pay. They pay more for the combed, a little bit less for the uh, sheared because there's more cashmere in the comb than there is the sheared. But I, I sell all my to clean cashmere. As far as making money, I, I wish I could make money off of my farm, but I have to keep my day job. Oh. That's the story of farmers around the world. I mean, if I could just stay be a stay at home farmer, I, I would, but I can't. I have around a hundred head of cashmere right now. Um, and I, I can't, I can't stay home. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Uh, next question is a follow up from our talk about uh, electronet or high tensile wire. What is a good method to train a goat to respect um, electric fencing? Turn it on. I mean, they'll they'll come up and look at it, it and on. if it's on, it, they'll they'll stay away from it. I, I've not had any any problems when it when the fence is hot. They just barely go up and put their nose on it, and they're gone, never to return. I I know that. We used to have a Goats in the Woods project at Cornell where we would bring in wean kids and put them out in the the woods uh, for the summer um, to, um, to, um, to, to help with some evasive plants we had out there. And so we would have, to, we would bring 200 goat kids in and some of them had never been around Electronet uh, before and stuff. And so there was definitely that training period where there'd be a two day at least a two day period where we would put them into small you know paddocks of of electronet you know with a one person 
able to turn on and off the electronet and another person there to rescue the animal. And we would um, try and entice them to touch the fence uh, because we wanted everyone to touch the fence and get a good shock before we put them out in the woods where we weren't gonna be there to um, be able to help them if they got stuck, stuck in a fence. And so there, I mean, I think often they'll say put peanut butter on um, aluminum, you know, on a, on a piece of uh, aluminum foil and stick that on and, and that goats will be inquisitive and touch that. Instead, what we were doing is we had a lot of brush around and so we would just cut some honeysuckle or something and put it on the other side of the fence. And I know that one uh, one person who was managing one year, you know, she, she took a hose and put the hose on the goats before she put them out in the electronet. So they were all wet. And so they got shocked quite hard. It was, it was a dry year and she was worried that they weren't going to get much shock. So she, since we did have running water right there at the site, and we did have a hose. She she just ran water under the electronet, so the ground right under it was fairly wet. And then, um, and I have to say, they did get shocked quite severely um, at that um, at that time. And we would our hope was that every goat kid would get shocked hard. And then, um, and usually, if they get shocked one time and it's and it's a fairly traumatic shock, they they don't quest they don't test the fence at all after that. Well, that's so a compliment to the smartness of goats to figure out, ouch. <laughs> yeah. I, as I'm listening to the conversation tonight, I'm starting to think more about page wire because they can't get out because of the construction of the fiber of the wire and you put it around the same way that you would put a, I grew up on a farm in Ohio and, and we had page wire, but I hadn't thought about it, but I think page wire might be a really, if it's not too huge an area. Um, but it is just so expensive as soon as you go to do a bigger area. So, and, and you can't rotate in it. You can't subdivide it easily without using Electronet. So I think a lot of times you do want to train them well to Electronet. At our farm, we don't have to do a very severe training because the kids, when they first go out, they go in, out into some high tensile fencing or just into some smooth electronet. And they, they ex, um, we have them in a field right by the barn and they tend to, um, they tend to touch the electric, the poly wire or the high tensile and get shocked there. So they're really little when they get shocked, if they do get shocked and it's like, oh, that hurt, you know, or gee, everyone else, someone, my best buddy got shot. And so it's very, you know, they don't test the electronet as we start them on the electronet, they're, they're quite good with it. But the other was a situation where we were bringing in wean kids that had often hadn't been around any sort of electric fencing before. Um, but so, so I think if you can start them on a high tensile, some sort of smooth, hot wire that they're not going to get tangled in um, and let them get the concept that fencing is hot, then it's easy to pass them on to Electronet. But otherwise, starting with a short, small area that, that they're in that you can turn off the fence and rescue them and um, is, is a good way to initially train them. Great. So we're just about at, at the hour mark to end our webinar, and I'm sure everybody has chores to get to. Um, we do have two questions left. So if we can maybe do a lightning round for these two and then let everybody uh, get to their goat chores. The second to last question is, uh, do most people send their fiber to a mill? Is there a mill you'd recommend? And are there resources for processing by hand? I think that the only, and that's not a negative statement, but the, the only mill that I know of is still river mill in Connecticut and they use uh, they use the machinery that was developed by Larry Sutherland up in Prince Edward Island or was Prince Edward Island where Peter and I actually went as he was developing it and he's a brilliant man and so I think that that's the only and I'm probably wrong and I'd love there, to there are other mills but they do the best 
I wouldn't send it anywhere else, honestly. I, I've, I've tried two other ones and I feel like they're the best. Yeah. Right. And then but, what about yeah. processing by hand? Are there any rec um, resources for that? You can, but it takes a long time. <laughs> I, I can't, I don't see Jane Deardorff on here, but she does, she dehairs by hand. Yeah, she's, she's she's you know she's a rancher in 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 Washington State, and so you know the concept of huge is different from those of us that have small farms and are trying to do all these sort of things. But it's Jane Deardorff. She's she's a member and she's a remarkable woman, and it'd be worth contacting with her and just seeing what she does and what she offers because she's got a little machine that she works with. I also encourage everybody to come to our next AMA um, because it's going to be more focused on um, the crafting and fiber arts. And we have Stephanie Burke, who does a lot by hand also, who will be there. Um, so maybe we can remember to bring that up for the next one. And then last question before everyone gets back to chores. Um, do you recommend fiber testing each goat every year or can you just wait and test every other year as they get older? I'm an advocate for 100% testing every single year because if you're developing your herd, you want to get that information. You want to get that in that bloodline. And if it's a bloodline that's not working very well for you, then you can let it go. But you can't do it if you don't have the information. I, I agree with that. I I don't test all of my animals. Like if I'm, if I'm, I, a lot of times I don't, test all my weathers because I'm going to ship them for meat. Um, I, but anything I'm going to keep or use for breeding, I, I definitely would test. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think this is a great shout out to get some free fiber testing before May 31st. You can go to our website. Uh, we are just ending out a grant uh, with Langston University to do some free cashmere testing. So go to the uh, cashmeregoatassociation.org and you can learn more about how to do some free fiber testing there. In in the um, chat, I put it, some really broad rules of thumb for nutrition, just, but they're really, really broad uh, for sheep and goats. Um, thank you. Wow. Thank you. thank you, Tatiana. All right. And with that, I want to thank everybody so much for coming on. Um, sharing all of your wisdom, everything that you've learned over your time raising cashmere goats and other goat breeds with um, with us, um, even those that have been in it for a while, I think learned a lot today. And this is a really great resource for those who are just getting into cashmere. So we'll post this on YouTube for anybody who missed any parts. And I want to just thank everybody again for, for joining, for making the time. And thank and you for thank, the questions. And thank you very much for the, from the three of us. Yes, thank you. No problem. And uh, thank you to Rick for coming on last minute and helping out with the uh, all the technical stuff too. We appreciate you, Rick. Yeah. All right, everybody have a great night. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. See you. Bye. Bye.